everybody, my name is Kieran Hoff. Kale Hoff. And we own Threefold Video Production here in Bismarck, and we are brothers as well. So how's everybody's day going? You guys have a good day so far? Awesome. Good to hear we saved the most boring topic for last. So if you guys fall asleep, don't. You can fall, no, don't fall asleep. Um, interviews are super basic, and they seem super basic, and they can be really basic. Uh, and there's a million ways to do them right. But there's a million ways to do them wrong, too. There's a lot of things that you can do to make your interviews a lot more successful and be really, really happy with the way that you do it. Yeah, and there's, like Ian said, there's tons of ways to do it wrong, and it's easy to overlook uh, and kind of just breeze over and not listen. But there are a lot of, it can be one of the most important parts of your film or video or whatever you're doing, and can have a huge impact. And, me and Keenan speak from experience from doing a lot of them, and the more we've done, the more we realize that they're not as simple as they seem, and there's always something to learn new with them. So, so uh, if you pull back up the PowerPoint, um, we're going to be covering two parts to this, and the first part is going to be the technical stuff. So, the technical stuff is going to include the lighting, the sound, the camera composition, and everything that goes in with the setup that we have here. And then the second part is going to be the actual interview itself and some techniques and some things that we do uh, to see it be a little bit more successful and to make the people behind the camera uh, a little more comfortable. And as we go over some of this stuff, there's, there's a lot of equipment up here. Uh, some of you guys might not have access to all that, uh, but be creative. Get creative with how you guys use your equipment and uh, use lights, uh, use windows as lights, uh, use different things. Uh, to do your budgets on a, on a low, on a, or do your films on a low budget. So, the first part we're going to cover is a basic three point lighting. So, a show of hands, how many people know or have heard of the three point lighting? Man, not many. That is good. We got some things to teach you then. So, the four, there's, it's three and four, you know, there's four up there, it's three point. Uh, key fill in here. So, who out there can tell me? what the key light does. Someone. Anyone. Key light is your main light. Okay. Main light. Yeah, that's exactly it. Your key light is your main light. It's going to be doing all of the lighting. Um, the majority of it, it's your most important. Uh, if you take the other two away, you can get by with one light. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll touch on that in just a bit. Um, your fill light does exactly what it says it does. It fills in what the key light isn't hitting. Helps reduce harsh shadows, things like that. Uh, and then your hair light, your third one, is going to be the one that helps distinguish your subject from the background. It's really simple, uh, but it can be really important, especially in a scenario like this. We're going to be setting up a, a really basic one here, but in a situation like this when you have someone with dark hair in a black background, if you don't have a hair light, their head is just going to disappear into the background, and there's no separating their hair, their head, from the background, and it can look really funny. So, and there's some, a lot of scenarios where you don't have to use a hair light. If there's a, and we have an example of that too, where you have someone with dark hair on a light background, and you don't need to separate them from the background because it's, you can pretty easily see um, they're not sinking away into the background. So we have a few examples we'll kind of show you and explain what we used and what we did uh, to kind of get the look we have. So here's a perfect example. This is something we shot uh, a couple months ago, and this was a shot where for the key light we used a window, actually. And a lot of times that's what we prefer to use because you get really great light from the window. And it can be a really minimal setup with great results. Uh, for Phil, we use uh, same LEDs as we have up here. And here, like the same thing, we use LEDs. Go ahead, next one. This is another example. This one used a key in a fill. We didn't end up using hair light. Um, and for the key again, we used light. And as you can tell, probably in this, this was a very small room, so we were super limited, but we did it with just one light, and it's a pretty natural looking uh, interview, I'd say. It doesn't look necessarily like it was lit, but his face is still exposed properly, you have a nice background, and we chose to not go with a hair light, one for the size of the room, and the second reason was, he had dark hair, the background was light, there was that separation there, so it wasn't as vital to have that, compared to if that would have been a really dark background. So you see, we have the, the window light coming out on this side, and then for the fill light, we had one light that was bouncing off of the wall. So rather than pointing the light directly at him, we took and set the light and pointed it towards the wall, and it created a lot softer, lighter glow on his face that wasn't such a harsh, direct light uh, right beside him. Yeah, and that's, that's an important thing too with lighting. A lot of lights that you guys have, whether they're LEDs or just normal lights, or you can even use hardware lights, 
um, which when I first started, that was a big one that I used. I just used basically whatever I could get. Um, but a big thing you want to do when you do it is you want to use diffusion, because a lot of them will be really harsh. And with this, it's a pretty simple form that we're using here. But it's just a really simple way to soften the light, because if you just hit them straight on with light, you're going to have some really harsh, drastic shadows. And so by diffusing, you get a lot softer light that looks a lot more flattering. So these lights are daylight temperature. Who knows what like number K is daylight temperature? Okay, so color temperature for daylight would be about 5,000. And when you're shooting interviews, that's another essential part to lighting. When we use uh, daylight as, as our key light, we make sure that our other two lights that we're using in conjunction with it are daylight balanced. The lights you see in here are really warm. There are a lot of them are tungsten. So you don't want to be mixing daylight and tungsten or whatever it would be. Because when you start mixing a lot of lights, you start getting weird skin tones and you can just uh, not help with the interview and the way it looks. So you want to stick with the same color temperature lights. So these are some examples of key and fill lights. We're going to show you some examples of breaking that rule. And you can always break rules, and that's the great thing about uh, cinematography and doing videos, is you can always do something new. You can always try something new. But when you try something new or you break some rules, make sure you have a reason behind it. And we have a few examples here. Uh, this is a Vimeo staff pick by, a, uh, by Breakwater Studios. And it was just recently picked, it was something that caught her eye. So this was the interview that they did, and it was just a single point lighting. And it's really drastic and really harsh. You can see how you can hardly see uh, the whole right side of his face. But the reason it worked, and the reason it was so close, is because it was a really intimate, really heavy topic. He had just talked about how his business had failed, and shortly thereafter, a few months later, his wife was diagnosed with cancer. So it was a really emotional topic for him. And he was really opening up. There's one point in the interview that he almost broke into tears. And you can see him and hear it in his voice, uh, the emotion that's coming through. And so the drastic lighting and the close shot really helped portray that story, rather than setting something farther away like we have in this video, or something that's really well lit. So this worked for their story. So make sure you have an interview set up that really works for your story and helps tell your story. This next example, uh, this one caught, our, uh, caught my eye personally, and I've really been, I've really gravitated towards it because of the way they lit it. Uh, and I'll give you a little context to what's happening. Uh, this was made by Veta Brevis Films, and they're a film production company out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And they did this for a distilling company. And what's so unique about this to me is they interviewed three guys that started this business. Um, all three of them really had a passion for distilling and wanted to make it a business. But they're all very unique in the film, not showing. But the way that they lit each one so separately and unique really portrays and helps put, put that into place how unique each one of them are, uh, is. And in the top right, you can see that guy. He's kind of the engine behind the whole operation. And he's the only one that has a wide shot. And it really tells the story. It helps, it helps show the uh, tools and everything he uses in the background. Uh, really well, and it's really unique too the way that they, they lit it. And the other one that had all the knowledge of how to distill, he was their technical guy that knew everything from the starting to ending to making really great distilling drinks. Yeah, and then the other thing, um, and the reason I really like this and wanted to bring it to your guys' attention is for this, as you probably can tell, they have one source of lighting, and that's just a key light. And for that, they didn't even use a light, they used a garage. So it was super basic, super simple and something anyone can do without a lot of equipment. Um, and the way they did that too is it's just a single point lighting, really drastic lighting, but they made it work and they took the time to set it up right and get it positioned with people and then they have reasonings for uh, doing short side lighting on the top right guy, broad side on the bottom. And to give you context to what that means is when you have someone facing, uh, doing an interview off camera interview where they're not looking into the camera, um, they're always gonna be looking off either to the right or to the left. Um, and whichever way the, where you see the most of their face, the uh, broad side of their face would be, so on the bottom, that would be the broad side of his face, obviously it's the one that's getting hit with the key light, um, so that would be the broad side. The most light, the broad side lighting has the most light. And then the top, the short side lighting, you see you have the broad side of his face, but it's all dark, so that's considered short side lighting, because so you see the shortest little bit of his face, 
that's actually being lit by the key light. Yeah, and they're both super simple techniques. There's tons of other, you can, you can Google and research tons of different light, lighting techniques like Rembrandt and uh, just, there's so many ways with photography and film, both apply. Um, and they're just different. They're both different ways to do it. Neither one's right, neither one's wrong. And it's super simple to do too with a little bit of research. So. And these helped tell their stories. They all had a different unique thing that they brought to the distillery. And the first two that were interviewed um, were the two on the uh, right side that had a darker interview. And they talked a lot more about the challenges and the, and the struggles that they faced as a business in starting. And about three-fourths or halfway through, um, the last guy was introduced and he really talked about their process and why they chose to do what they did. And so it made sense for them, that interview to be a little bit farther away and not so close and personal uh, because the topic was a lot, like a little less close and personal uh, for most. So on to the next part. Now we've covered lighting. The next part that we're going to cover for the technical stuff is sound. And sound is just as important as the video. And there's two main uh, ways that we do sound when me and Keenan set up for interviews. Uh, what we have set up right here is a boom mic, and that's usually our go-to. That's what we have for our main source. Uh, and then we always do a lav mic as a backup. Now, you can do a lav mic as your main one and do a boom mic as your backup. It doesn't matter. We prefer boom. But both are really great options, and they're something to not overlook. And a lot of times, it's really easy to set up an interview, make sure your frame looks good, check with the camera, and then overlook checking your audio levels or checking or not checking if there's noise in the background, things like that. So the biggest thing with audio is set up good audio, put just as high of importance on it as video, and test it. Always test your audio. Put on the headphones before anyone's ever even in there, before your interviewee sits down, and make sure that there's not clocks and fans, appliances, things beeping in the background, because we found ourselves a lot of times overlooking it, and we didn't even notice the sound in the background that the mic was picking up. So it's it's really easy to overlook and test Don't screw it up. Yeah. That's, no, but just take a little extra time to make sure there's not a crackle in the microphone that picks up when they move around a little bit. Put your headphones on and really give it a listen because sometimes you can't hear the fan in the background that's just blowing a little bit and the mic is picking it up and you don't realize the mic's picking it up as loud as it is and you can all of a sudden get into the editing process and half of your interview is ruined because something is going on in the background and it really pulls away. And sound is one more of those things that you just don't want to distract from what they're saying. You don't want to distract them uh, from the story anymore uh, with distractions in the audio. So the next one we got is camera composition and setup. Um, and this one, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, but these are kind of good rules to go off, rules of thumbs. Um, and that one is, and like I said, with lighting you can try to break the rules. You can try to try something new. That's the part of being creative and it's part of what makes making films really fun. But um, keeping your A camera, which in this case this is going to be our A camera, and this is our B camera. Keeping it at eye level will really help the viewer to connect with the person being interviewed. Uh, a lot of times shooting too low can be a little unflattering, things like that. The other thing you want to do is avoid wide angle lenses. And there's two main reasons for this. One, wide angle lenses can make people look unflattering and can stretch their face. The perspective on wide angle lenses just isn't the best go-to choice for interviews. And the other thing is because it's going to make them feel uncomfortable because it's going to have to be a lot closer than it is. And so, like Daniel talked about, they had a lot of actors and a lot of people that are used to acting on set and doing, and doing things that will help them uh, or they're the doing things that they're used to. Whereas in an interview, a lot of times you're with people that are nervous about being interviewed. They're not very comfortable behind the camera, and so they really want to be able to feel as comfortable as possible. And so you really want to be able to distance yourself a little bit, kind of let them forget that the camera is even there. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, the other thing is for B camera. So that kind of covers some like little things on A camera composition and stuff, and we'll go over a little bit more here. We're gonna have some people come up in just a second and help us with that. Um, with B camera and A camera, you never want objects coming out of people's heads. It's always Can we switch back to the presentation real quick. Um, it's always really important to make sure that when you set up an interview and you put someone in the seat, that there's not something coming like a pole or something coming out of someone's head. That's the last thing you want in the interview. Is you know bunny ears in the back or something that's distracting. Or a tree or something, like I said with audio, uh, a pole or a tree coming out of their, their head in the background uh, can be one more thing to distract them from what they're saying. 
And a lot of times it's a matter of moving the camera a few inches to the right or a few inches to the left with the interviewer a few inches. Um, so it doesn't take much to avoid those distractions. And then the last, last part about the camera composition, this kind of goes for A and B camera. When you position someone, don't pin them up against the wall. Give them a little bit of space between them and the background. So you give them a little bit of room to breathe and they don't feel so pinned up uh, with a wall right behind them. So moving on to B camera, and we can have some people come up. Uh, we're going to need someone to be in the hot seat, be the interviewee, someone to be the interviewer, um, and then person on key and fill, or key or fill and hair light, excuse me, and then one on the key light. Four, five, four. We need four volunteers. All right, uh, I saw that hand go up really fast. Uh, pink sleeves. Jean jacket. Uh, somebody from the back who wants to like get squirrely in the back. All right, you come up. So while you guys are coming up, I'm just going to uh, cover the importance of a B camera. B camera is super great. It makes editing and post production way easier to cut an interview because when you're cutting it, it doesn't have to feel like you're cutting out parts because you're just switching to a new camera. So we're going to set this up here. Have you on? Uh, so, as we set this up, uh, can we bring the house lights down for you? This side? And we're going to show you, we're going to switch to this. Uh, maybe. All right, we'll leave it at this um, for a second. We're going to kind of show you how adding in, can we have the house lights just. Um, a little bit brighter for right now, or the yeah, stage lights too even. Um, just to dim. We're going to show you how adding each light kind of affects the look of the interview. Um, so we could switch this to uh, camera seven. All right. So have you come on over here? Okay. So you might need to edit that too a little. Okay, so we're just going to bounce back on the original topics we talked on, which was lighting. So first, we're just going to bounce back to lighting, and so you guys can see on screen. So right now on the screen, you can tell that uh, the key light. Uh, now, like you said, this is kind of similar to what we saw in some of those interviews, um, those single point lighting setups that we showed you. So now, if you want to turn on the fill light once for us, now. Turn this up just a hair. Now the fill light, you don't want it to overpower the key light uh, unless you're looking for a really even. You still want your key light to be your strongest source of lighting. Um, can we switch to camera eight? So, get focus. <laughs> you're doing great. So, do you want to flip the fill light off for a second? So okay. do you see how that fills in the, the right side of her face, kind of takes away some of those really harsh shadows. So another thing to point out before we turn on the hair light is right now, right here, she sort of just sinks off into the background and you can't really tell where, where the background is or where her head ends and it can make it like look a lot longer than it is. So that's the importance of a hair light with, dark, with a dark background. So we'll turn the fill light back on. So now, Keaton, if you want to get that a little farther back that way. There we go. So now, and obviously these, these could be adjusted a lot more, but we won't fiddle with the lights for too long on stage here to save time. Uh, so we'll have you look at the interviewer. Now, if we turn this on and off, you can sort of see that on the screen, how much of a difference that makes. It kind of lights up her shoulder right here, it brings some light to the back of her head, and it doesn't let her sink off just into kind of oblivion. So, yeah. <laughs> um, now the next thing, example. With the boom, uh, I'm sure everyone's pretty familiar with booms. You've always seen them in TV shows, them bouncing into camera shots, everything like that. 
Um, now, in our case, we always like to use a C stand, and now that's not going to be the case with everything. Um, but obviously, you're going to want the boom as close as you can without getting in the camera. It's a pretty obvious, uh, you don't want that in the camera. And the other thing that we choose to do is we choose to use a C stand because it's less distracting, too. A lot of times you see people, even if you have a person holding the boom mic, they're going to be a little, there's going to be a little bit of movement, and if you have something moving up and down in front of a person while they're being interviewed, it's not exactly the most comfortable thing. It makes you feel, someone that's not comfortable being in front of a camera is going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So, so another thing to point out that's unique to who our interviewee is right now is if you notice on our glasses, there's a glare. And we won't take the time right now, but a lot of times you can get that glare away and you can pull that away by just moving the lights in a few different directions or lifting them up just a few inches or lifting them down. Um, and when she's looking and you want to make sure that's all set up, she's looking at the interviewer. So that's another thing to take into consideration, that there's not a super harsh glare on somebody's glasses. You want to be able to see their eyes while they're being interviewed. Okay, so we're going to move to... Uh, the camera composition and cameras. So, if you want to be on this, the way this works too. Plug this, you can do it with slide it in. Um, and then this just locks it. So, um, and then if you want to come over here, there's a bunch to do, but I'll have you just man the A camera. Woman, the A camera. Yes. <laughs> okay, so with camera composition, we did we touch on 180 degree roll? No, we haven't. I don't think we touched on 180 degree roll. And this is a super point really quick. So, 180 degree rule, how many have heard of this by chance? Okay, so we got a few, that's really good. Now, this is super important when you're shooting with two cameras because, and it pertains to a lot of things. It pertains to dialogue and films, it pertains to interviews, it pertains to basketball games and sports. Um, and what this does is, could we get split screen both cameras up here once? Uh, okay, so. Right now, as you can tell, looking at the frame, we have two cameras, obviously, we have A and B, and the interviewee is looking off to the right of the frame, which is good. So when you're editing that, every time you cut from A camera to B camera to A camera, you'll be getting the person looking off to the same direction, and you'll get the sense that they're talking to the same person. So now, both screens, you can see she's looking off the right side on, on both of them. So what you don't want to do is, We'll show it right here. We'll have Caleb grab camera B. And this would be breaking the 180 degree rule. Is right here, imagine there's a line. You can see it in that picture or that video uh, or the picture that we had up there before. Um, you don't want to cross that imaginary line. That imaginary line kind of starts where the interviewer is. And if we switch, once we switch back to this uh, split screen, you'll see that in one camera, she is, we can move that light normally. Well, you wouldn't shoot like this, but. Um, in one camera, she is looking off to the right, and one camera, in the other camera, she's looking off to the left. So it can be really confusing to know who she's actually talking to, or who they're talking to, who their interview is, and it just is gonna pull them away, like one more thing to pull them away from the actual interview. So, now, we'll show you a few examples of uh, side profile. You wanna grab B? It. Yeah. That's so the great thing about the 180 degree rule is you can start right at that interviewer and go all the way around to get right behind her, get a side profile, and it still works because she's still looking off to the same side. She's still looking off to the left side of the frame. So we'll try something here. Okay. So now, as you can tell, and you can get really creative with the B camera. And the great thing about a B camera, and not that you're always going to have one when you're shooting, but when you have them, like Keenan said, you can get side profiles, you can get hand movement shots that are really great for editing. You can punch in and get a lot tighter shots for when the uh, interview and the and the interviewee is getting really you know emotional or intense parts of the interview. So it can be really useful and helpful for that, just like she's doing, getting a you know a tight shot. So that kind of explains 180 degree rule where even though we're doing a side profile shot, she's looking off to the right in both shots, and that's exactly what you want. And like I said, this pertains to basketball, it pertains to sports and dialogues, because with basketball, for instance, if you'd have cameras breaking that 180 degree rule, one shot you'd have 
A team running down the court going left, and then if you switch to a shot on the opposite side, you can have B team running in the exact same direction and just get disorientated. So, so and the last thing is the B camera, as you kind of saw there, the B camera can really pick up a lot of body language and a lot of things of, that she's expressing through her, her face, her facial expressions, or things with her hands. A um, little more detail shots that the A camera can't pick up because it's a little bit wider. So. And, and one last thing we'll do. Uh, now, you can't see directly, but I'll have you scoot just a hair this way for me once. Now, if you see the composition right now, you can kind of see that there's a C stand and then there's a film strip in the background. And this isn't a bad scenario, but if that film strip wasn't there and it was just the, the chrome C strip or C stand in the back, that would be an example of what we we're talking about where something's coming out of their head, it's really distracting, and you just want to avoid that, where a camera, we don't have that. It's just her on a black canvas. You can have objects in the background, but when it's a, sticking out like a sore thumb, eh, that's not something you want, so. So yeah. All right, that concludes part one. So give it up for all of our volunteers. So practice definitely helps us get better. So the first thing is prep. Now, <clears throat> we always take it pretty seriously when we don't want someone to sit in on the camera and be where they're supposed to be for the interview if we haven't set up lights, if we haven't set up audio or camera or any of that stuff. We want to have that stuff prepared beforehand because if you set someone in there, the interviewee, and all of a sudden you're fiddling with lights and making like setting up stuff and testing all that stuff, it's going to make them more nervous because Oftentimes, like Keenan said, and we've said multiple times, when you're doing an interview, you're trying to get a really authentic reaction and you want to get real with the person. And most people you have on camera aren't used to being on camera unless they're an actor or something like that. So a lot of times, people aren't comfortable being behind the camera, like I said. And so you want to eliminate the amount of time that they have to sit behind the camera. And so if you sit behind the camera and you're still setting up tripods and setting up lights and setting up audio, it gives them that much more time to think about and be nervous about the interview and noticing every little thing around them. Whereas if you can have everything ready so that they sit down and you make one a little adjustment or something and all they have to do is think about the questions that you're talking to them about, it pulls a lot of those distractions away. And that's why we avoid things like action rolling sound speed. And those are really great when you're on a film and you're working with actors. But when you're working with someone who's not used to being on a camera, yelling out action is only going to make them nervous. And so a lot of times, what me and Keenan do, we'll start rolling the camera ever before they even think it's rolling, and you can get really great reactions, great smiles, things like that from your interviewee. So. The second part is research. Know who you're interviewing. If you're doing uh, an interview for a company or for you know, a single person, uh, know a little bit about them. Go above and beyond what the interview is actually about and the five things that you want to cover and have some things to talk to them about that will relate personally to them. And while you're in the interview, don't be afraid to talk about those things. It'll make them more comfortable, it'll let them trust you, and it'll, they'll in turn give you a lot better answers and be a lot more authentic with you on camera. There's a lot of times we'll have a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes of footage of the interview that doesn't really apply to what we're talking about, but it made them a lot more comfortable while they're sitting there getting ready and talking about it. And then when we get to the questions that we really want the answers for, they're ready to answer them because they answer things that they really liked about it. They like dogs. We talk about dogs for a few minutes, and all of a sudden you ask them about their business, and they're really comfortable on a roll, like, yeah, no, this is, this is how we do it. And they're a lot smoother that way. Yeah, and that uh, goes into our next topic, which is connecting with the person. Um, this is, hands down, one of the most important parts is being able to connect with who you're doing an interview with. It can absolutely make or break it. You can have great audio, you can have great sound, but if at the end of the day the person wasn't comfortable, if they didn't give you a good, um, good interview, 
that can a lot of times be your fault. Um, and we take that a lot of times, or personally, if, if an interview didn't turn out, you can't instantly point fingers at the person you're interviewing because you knew going in they weren't comfortable. It was your job to make them comfortable and be able to connect with them. And this is where Keenan's really good because when we do a shoot, I'm the one behind the camera doing a lot of the technical stuff, and Keenan's the one that sits down. And once we get in an interview and start talking with that interviewee, he doesn't fiddle with the camera, he's not touching any of the lights, he's not messing with the sound, he is 100% engaged with who he's interviewing and nothing else. Because when you can connect with them and make them feel like they're sitting down for coffee instead of sitting down in front of a camera, you're going to get so much better sound bites, you're going to get way better interview. And I start that conversation a long time before we ever sit down in the interview. There's a lot of times I'll be in another room or outside while, they're, while we're still setting up, um, just outside the room where the interview will be taking place, and Caleb will be getting things ready, and I'll have a chance to talk with them and have a conversation. And at that point, I can go, yeah, hey, let's take a seat, we'll just kind of keep getting things ready, and all of a sudden we're starting into the interview, and they don't even really know that it's happening yet. So that brings us to the next point of questions, how you ask questions. And so uh, we have Christian from uh, the present presentation earlier on zombies, you guys remember him. Um, he's going to be helping us out for an interview. Christian will have you take a seat there. And I'm going to run him through a few questions. And I want you guys to pick out a few things on how we do the first interview. Is everybody ready? Yes. Everybody thank Christian for coming up and helping us. All right, can we switch to camera A? Uh, sorry. Yeah, camera A. Camera A. One of the cameras. Any of the cameras. All right, so, uh, Christian, um, uh, is this your first film festival you've ever been to? Yes. Um, do you, uh, what's your favorite food? Hot dog. Mm. Uh, how, how is your flight here? Good. Um, okay, so can we play back what we got from him? Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, they're going to pull that up, and then we're going to pull out, point out a few things on what happened in that interview. I think they can play back. We'll see. I pretend to reenact.
can spin it and go, oh, wow, that's awesome. What do you love about hot dogs so much? Why, why are, is hot dogs your favorite food? And all of a sudden, you can start getting the answers that you want to get, even if you answer, even if you ask a closed-ended question and they gave you a, a one-word answer, know how to spin their answer into another question and, and get them to talk a little bit more about it. So we're gonna do the we're gonna do that same thing one more time. We're gonna do the bad interview, we're gonna re-record re it. So and we want to just play it back. And this will be a good example of interview. How much time we can do it. We can do it again. No, we'll do it. Hi, welcome. Um, is this your first film festival? Uh, yes. Uh, what's your favorite food, for the record? Hot dog. I don't like hot dogs. Um, oh. <laughs> How's the flight? It's good. Yeah. I don't like flying very much, though. So. Um, okay. Ten out of ten. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. He's a guy. He's a guy. He's a guy. He's a guy. This is also another example of the 180 degree rule, cutting from an A camera to a B camera. Um, you still get the sense that he's looking off to the right, and it's uh, one of those really important things to keep in mind with too. So. so one thing that we do, and one thing that is more of my role uh, with what, how our interviews go is, I research and I know the questions I want to ask before I get to the interview, and we don't show up with a piece of paper. So I don't sit there with a piece of paper and make sure I'm bullet pointing every question that I wanted to get across. I know a lot of the answers I want him to say before we ever step in there. So know what you want to get out of your interviewer, and you're able to ask a lot of the questions, and let questions tie into other questions. Because again, a piece of paper can be really distracting. It can be rustling. You can pick that up on the mic, and it can distract him from saying something really emotional or diving in to something that he might talk a lot about. So, so we're going to go through. That's a great face. <laughs> we'll do one interview of how, I guess, would be the right way to do it. You can kind of get the example. Christian, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're so glad you can make it to the to North Dakota, to Bismarck. Um, so tell me, I mean, how did you get started filmmaking? How old were you? What, what drew you to filmmaking? Oh, it was watching movies, it was watching how movies were made, those specials that would come on and they would show you how they did things behind the scenes and that just like, uh, like I guess was the bug that got me to really want to be uh, in, like motivated to make films and, and when I was a little kid and I've just been now trying to make movies ever since and it's been great, it's awesome, I love it, yeah. So, so what was the first movie you ever made? Wow, it was probably with my little brother and he probably didn't want to be in it, and our dog, and we, it was in the mind of the dog. We pretend the video camera went into the dog's head, and then it chased my brother around the house, and oh, that was great. And that's where I started really learning how to work with actors, and to really start learning how long it takes to make a movie, and problems with dogs on set. So yeah, no, it was really fun. Yeah, and ever since, it's, I've been making movies since. So, so what's the movie you're most proud of? The movie I'm most proud of is probably the one I'm working on, or just finished right now, which is my zombie movie, Zombies of the Living Dead. And I'm so proud of it, worked really hard on it. It's a fun movie, it's a comedy. We're, we're, you can tell when you watch this film, we're having a blast. So what drew you to, to a zombie comedy movie compared to everything else you could do? What drew me to a zombie comedy movie was well, there's a lot of zombie movies right now. There's The Walking Dead. There's a lot of you know television shows out there, 
And I thought, well, why not? You know, like, they're fun, they're messy, they're, especially with comedy thrown in there to like horror and gore, it could be really silly and something really fun. And so, and they're just two, really, the technical aspect of it, it's just fun to work on a horror movie with friends. When, you know, I know it looks disgusting on camera, but the, the fun we're having uh, behind the scenes or making the movie, that's really, I think, why I chose to pick a zombie movie. They're just fun over other, like a drama or something else like that. Zombie films are really fun. So is your brother still making zombie movies? He is. He just made a music video for a few. Uh, just, I say just, but he made a, a music video with a zombie in it, starring me as the zombie. Actually, uh, yeah, and it's uh, uh, Veil Tombs is his. Uh, 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 Veil is his band, and uh, Tombs is the music video, and it's about a zombie going around and attacking these animals. Like people, so it's like zombies and monsters in the music video. So yeah, we're still we still have that young at heart, you know, kids making movies aspect going on. So. All right, give it up for Christian. Yeah. So, so there's some important things in there, and it's like it's being fully engaged in what he's saying. You're the one interviewing him. Make sure you care about what he's saying to you because you're the one that's going to be doing the editing and, and the actual putting together the film. And you want to make sure that he knows that you care what he's <clears> saying. So that little bit, like, I picked up that his, he mentioned his brother. And even though it's a, you know, he's here, his brother may not be as applicable to the story and what I want to get. But all of a sudden, he started diving in to his brother. So we'll, Watch this real quick. It's been great. It's so awesome. I love it. So, so what was the first movie you ever Turn off your lights. It was probably a little And probably one of you in it. And our dog was like, and we're like, it was in the mind of the dog. We pretend the video camera was into the dog's head. And it chased my brother around the house. And all that was great. And that's where I started really learning how to work with actors. And really started learning how long it takes to make a movie. So yeah, that was really fun. Yeah, ever since it's I've been making movies since. So, so what's the movie you're most proud of? The movie I'm most proud of is probably the one I'm working on, or just finished right now, is the zombie movie. Zombies of the Living Dead. And I'm so proud of it. We worked really hard on it. It's a fun movie, it's a comedy. Or you can tell when you watch this film, we're having a blast. So what drew you to, to a zombie movie? Right, well, we'll end that there real quick. But you get the idea, is that you can get a lot more authentic answers. And asking about his brother, even though it kind of led him down a rabbit trail, and asking what his brother's career choices are, may not be very applicable to an interview about him. But all of a sudden, he talked about a zombie movie or a zombie music video that he got to star in, and, and some more things that he's still working with his brother and, and doing films. And so uh, it can lead to some fun things if you can pick up things that they're talking about that they really care about. And, and the other thing to keep in mind too is, this is a, definitely a skill. It takes time. Um, every time you're on set and you're doing an interview like this, you're gonna learn something from it. And Keenan, like I said, me and Keenan have been doing this a long time. And if that was me in the seat interviewing him, it would be horrible because I'm just not used to it. I'm not good at it. Keenan has done it hundreds of times and he knows how to do it well. And you'll learn. So don't be afraid to mess something up. But do your best and be authentic with it. And I kind of showed too uh, at the end there, you know, being able to capture like body language, things like hand movements, things like that with the B camera without ever affecting the A camera. So with that, we're going to sort of wrap up our presentation. Does anyone have any questions for us? They can be yes or no questions. Yeah. Can you have more than two cameras? Uh, we do, we have three cameras. Uh, well, we have Most setups we just use two for the sake of editing. Uh, it definitely can get a lot more work intensive doing more than one camera or two cameras and file sizes obviously can get pretty hefty. Um, we shoot with 4K so that we have some flexibility in post again. Um, and so shooting three cameras only adds to that. So. All right, if you guys do have more questions, feel free to email me and Keenan both at Keenan at Threefold and Caleb at Threefold.tv. We'd love to answer any questions. We'd love to be uh, help to any of you. Honestly, if there's anything at all, uh, we want to help the community and 
help you guys. So, or reach out to us on Instagram, ask us questions on there. And lastly, before we finish up, I want to give a big thank you to Jim and Dakota Media Access and all the work that they put in. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Great afternoon.